Hi, everybody. Tina Brock, Producing Artistic Director here at the Idiopathic Radiculopathy Consortium in Philadelphia. I'm your host for Into the Absurd, a virtually existential dinner conversation. I do hope you'll join us the next 50 minutes. Sit back and relax as we explore the lives, the hearts, the minds, and the spirits of creators in Philadelphia region and around the world. And good afternoon, everybody. Hi, Tina Brock here, your host for Into the Absurd. Thanks so very much for joining us this afternoon on such a beautiful day. On today's show, we're going to be talking with Jeffrey Stanley. And uh, if you're here in on the Zoom, in our Zoom dining room, thanks so much for joining us. And we hope you'll uh, send your questions for Jeffrey in the chat box. And if you're on Facebook Live, again, welcome, welcome, welcome. We've uh, been here every week, 5 p.m. since June, and going to continue to have these conversations even when we get back on the stage. So we're very appreciative you're in the audience. Today, Jeffrey Stanley. Jeffrey is a playwright. He is a screenwriter. He is the recipient of a 2018-2019 Fulbright Scholarship where he's been studying Bengali film and, uh, and theater. And I got a chance to see Jeff and his work on stage. And we'll talk about that on today's show as well, in addition to all his studies and a book that he's working on right now. So welcome to Into the Absurd, Jeffrey Stanley. Hello. Hello. (laughs) Thanks for being here. Can you hear me and see me okay? I can hear you and I can see you absolutely perfectly. Sure. Thank you for having me. Oh, gosh. It's it's my pleasure. Great. Um, there's so much to dig into here. I feel like you are the consummate journeyman in um, in in your life, in your work, in your studies, <laughs> and trying to whittle all of that down to, you know, 50 minutes is is tricky. But I'm gonna we're gonna give it a try here and 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 take the journey where where you will. Um, I, I want to start out back in okay, cool. your high school, you know, uh, high school or you're in, in Virginia is where you you yeah. were. And um, I read you, you know, had your eyes on and were ready to go to New York City to NYU, uh, Tish. And I guess, were you aware at the time that you left to go to New York? Did you know you wanted to be a writer? Yeah, very much so. Um, definitely film and theater related. I mean, like a lot of teenagers, I was also writing a lot of poetry, uh, but I was very much gravitating toward some some form of script writing. And I knew that <clears throat> there was a bar I was going to get with local courses, you know, my community college and things like that. The nearest film program was was NYU that I considered of any real significance, you know, even as a teenager. I knew it had to be the West Coast or New York. And since I also like theater, the New York thing seemed better than strictly L.A. Mm -hmm. So um, but I mean, it was a real pipe dream at that time. I was the first person in my family to go to college or even think about college and not only college, but New York City. You know, I was growing up in the Bible Belt. So uh, I was very much it was my decision. I very much went on my own. I had some great support, especially from I have to give a shout out to my high school English teacher, who's still my very close friend, Rose Townsend. I never would have done the things I have done as a writer, if not for her. So, uh, you know, it was very much like I went to NYU, moved, moved to New York when I was 19, thinking this might not work out. Maybe after a semester, I'm going to have to go crawling back home. But, you know, I found ways to make it work and, and make it through and, and stick around there and uh, eventually go from uh, being an undergrad film student to a grad dramatic writing student where I got to spread my wings as a playwright and a screenwriter and think about similarities and also the differences and realize, I think, that I made the right decision in staying in New York so that I could keep pursuing theater in addition to my film interests. Was there ever a time you seriously thought about leaving? No. Yeah. Once you got <laughs> no, there, you I mean, were, I, you were you, there. I, I was very, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, uh, people say, you know, I know it's easy to say this, you know, you come into a city and think, I don't know anything about this place, but I have to live here. And it's people, I've said that about New York, And people go, well, that's New York. It's easy. Everybody says that about New York. And really, they don't. I mean, most Mm -hmm. people visit New York and say, this is fun, but get me the hell out of here. You know, so I I think it does take a 
I don't know if it's special or good, but, you know, maybe it means I was neurotic. I don't know. But I knew I wanted to be there and, yeah. and stay there as crazy as it is and, and not get too far away from it, which is why I never went further away than Philly from yeah. from NYC, because it's still a bus ride, a train ride away. And I can go back and forth between those two worlds pretty easily. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you about that sentiment that it's something you're there and it's, you realize this is, this is the place either it's for you or it's, it's not for you. Um, you wrote <laughs> yeah. somewhere that, yeah. you know, you studied uh, in under uh, David Ives and Tony Kushner. And, um, and I wonder if there's any, any um, for either, either one of those two playwrights, if there is anything specific that you garnered from that or was it? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, that was on separate occasions uh, and, you know, a couple of years apart. But, yeah, David Ives especially, uh, I it's so funny in retrospect. I mean, he was a huge influence on me. I don't mean the way I wrote or I tried to write like him with the wordplay or anything like that. But his seriousness as a playwright and also his being his very own person, writing what he wanted to write, following his bliss in a certain way. And uh, I mean, when I was his grad, I was a grad student working on a Civil War screenplay, like 19th century about Southern draft dodgers in the Civil War, a world apart from who he is and where he's from. But he really loved that and really worked with me. You know, it, it inspired me to expand this and, and make it into this this thing that won an award and got me my first agent and all this stuff. And, you know, he was a huge uh, influence on me also to stay in New York. I could all, he showed me that you can be a screenwriter and shop things around LA and stay in New York and still be a playwright. And then I, you know, his essays, I mean, sometimes he had things in the New Yorker, you know, different magazines. And I, uh, that indirectly influenced me as I wanted to be, I guess, a person like him who in a way followed my bliss. So I would write a screenplay. I would write a play. Sometimes something would happen to me or I'd see something and go, that's a New York times article what the heck, I'm going to try it. And I pitch it to the New Yorker, New York Times, Washington Post. Sometimes they said yes, sometimes they said no. But, uh, you know, I didn't have any special contacts at any of those places. But, you know, when they said yes, it was such a thrill. And I, I still say that to my students today, my writing students. Don't let anyone tell you you should only ever be writing screenplays or you're not serious. Or you should only be writing stage plays or you're not a serious playwright. You can write all kinds of stuff and flex different muscles to do those things. And, uh, you know, there's a whole world out there as a writer. So don't let anyone shoehorn you, pigeonhole you. And and I, I attribute a lot of that attitude I have to David mm-hmm. Ives. When did you decide you wanted to apply for Fulbright Scholarship? Um, well, yeah, that's kind of a funny story. I mean, my I'll try to make it short, but, you know, so my ex is Indian American, first generation. Her parents were not only from India, but specifically from West Bengal, Kolkata, where the native language is Bengal, uh, Bengali, excuse me. So we would go every other year and explore the whole country. But Kolkata was our sort of locus. And because of my own interest in history, and theater and all that stuff, religion. I wanted to know that stuff about that area. And so I would make these Google Maps walking tours for myself before I went every year, visiting the old historic theaters or where they once were, finding books that aren't really available here, that are only published there about some historic personages. And it was just a hobby of mine. I just loved doing it. And Every so often, someone would say, you should apply for some kind of grant. And I would say, for what? I mean, it's all been written about. I don't I like knowing it. I don't really have anything to add to the conversation. And this would go on for every year. And, you know, it was like this obsession I had. But I never I was fine not writing about it. And and then eventually I wrote a couple of pieces about uh, related to it for the Washington Post's uh, on faith section. And, and then it popped up in a, the New York press newspaper. I wrote an article about how I like eating pawn, uh, yeah. which is this uh, disgusting leaf with tobacco <laughs> you chew there. I have questions. You know? and, so, uh, <laughs> and so I can talk about that too. But anyway, at some point it like lightning struck. You know, about eight years of that. And, you know, I was in I was not seeking a way to apply for a Fulbright or anything. Uh, It just happened. And when I've got it, there's this thing I'm actually interested in and I can't find a book about it. 
because no one's written this book here or there that I could find. And I, then I got excited about uh, how pop culture, well, how early film and early theater, early meaning early 20th century, mm -hmm. late 19th, early 20th century, thinking about us as playwrights and artists now, how we respond to current events. How are the playwrights responding to the independence movement? Were they responding at all? You know, the nascent independence movement that was just starting in India in the late 19th, early 20th century. And how are the British responding to the playwrights? And that's where I got went sort of down this rabbit hole. And uh, through that, I learned about this forgotten. He's not forgotten. There's a filmmaker, Hiralal Sen, who's very mm -hmm. arguably India's first filmmaker. Um, but all of his films were destroyed in a fire. That's the way the story goes. And so how do you write about a pioneering filmmaker, all of whose films have been destroyed? and how much of his story is legend, how much of it is fact. And uh, so that, why, and what was he doing? Did he respond to uh, British uh, oppression of artists? And did he speak out about the independence movement through his work in any way? I didn't know what the answers to these things would be. Um, so these things all kind of intertwine because Hiralal Sen hung out with the playwrights. He hung out with the artists. It was a pretty small performing arts community in Bengal at that time. And if people don't know Kolkata or Calcutta, as it was called then, it's interesting, too, because it was the capital of British India for most of their rule until 1911 They moved uh, when they moved to Delhi. So anything that went on, anything the British decided, imposed on the people, was done to Bengalis first. They would sort of field test things there. And so that's where the first rabble rousing went on. The first play that was banned by the British was written by a Bengali. Uh, the first film banned was made by a Bengali. Uh, and uh, the first newspapers that were banned were ban written by Bengalis. And so... Uh, Long before Gandhi showed up, and we think of Gandhi as representing India's independence movement, but he came later. Uh, the real history of it got started uh, with the people of Bengal. So that really excites me, too. Mm -hmm. So how did you piece it together? How did you piece his filmmaking, well, his the, contribution? The, the through book is... <laughs> well, uh, you know, the, the, the narrative, the book covers film, uh, Hiralal Sen, and it gets into Bengali theater, um, which at that time was very British influenced, but they wanted to branch out and do their own things. When I say British influenced, I mean, I mean, Western influenced. So uh, the, the town was segregated. There were British theaters where they were doing what we would call well-made plays, the five act drama. Mm -hmm. Well, Bengalis had never quite seen that. And they knew they knew about Shakespeare. They were people were there were educated and had read read and studied Shakespeare. But there were some Bengali playwrights in the 1870s and performers who said, let's try our own theater. But in that style, which we think is pretty cool, but uh, in Bengali with Bengali characters and Bengali situations about Bengali life. So they got started on that. What what existed uh, at the same time was this folk theater called Jatra, uh, which means travel, journey. It's a tra traveling folk theater. I could go on forever about that. I'll try to keep it brief. But that was this outdoor traveling folk theater with a lot of singing and dancing. So right away, these Bengali playwrights working in indoor proscenium stages in the city, trying this new thing. So with the fact that Bengali audience are bidding films. Hiralal Sen. So Hiralal Sen is first exhibiting films imported European and American films. He's just traveling around showing them. Finally, he gets the idea to shoot his own films. The first thing he shoots is scenes from stage plays. He goes into the theater and shoots dance sequences, things that were visual. It's a, still a silent medium. So that's why he, comes, he gets involved in the theater community uh, at the same time. Uh, that They are starting to... Uh, once the plays are underway, they quickly become political. And I don't know how far down that road you want to go. I'll keep it brief. But here's what happened. The British uh, would not allow anything that they felt was seditious. You could not even say, I hope India is independent one day. That would get you arrested. You could not say, British rule is not that great. You couldn't even say that. So here's what the playwrights did. 
And at this time, Bengali newspapers were getting very, very vocal. They were saying uh, it's time sometimes uh, it's time for a racial war. They looked at our civil war and said the only way to stop this oppression is through violence. We learned that from the American Civil War. Um, so they were looking at a lot like the Niagara movement here as uh, inspirations for how to deal with the British. Uh, and so and they were getting arrested. The, the presses were getting arrested and editors shut down. So what the playwrights did is look to their heroic past. So you would take a, a, an ancient Hindu warrior from 500 years previous who rose up and fought anybody. It didn't matter. He probably fought the Mughal invaders. And it didn't matter whether he won or lost. It was kind of like the Alamo. It's that he rose up and fought. These were plays couched as historical plays, but they were about telling Indians to rise up and fight the British without saying rise up and fight the British. You know this because you look at how the plays were advertised. Instead of just historical drama, it was grand national patriotic drama mm. and uh, extensive uh, descriptions in this way of you will feel your blood stir when you see the great warrior Shivaji rise up and fight. <laughs> it was really clear the coded message they were sending to the audience. It's time to fight. And they weren't sending usually messages of peace. This was not about Gandhi and passive resistance. The, there are a lot of things people have forgotten that we don't know. We've forgotten about British rule in India. There was intentional mass starvation public beatings of Indian children. Uh, there were kidnappings, tortures, extortion. <laughs> the police would kick in your door and search your house if they thought you didn't own enough British imported stuff in your house. Mm -hmm. So they were really living under a, a militarized police state. And, th and they were having violence done to them on a regular basis. So in 1908, that's when the assassinations and the bombings begin. And that's only then do some of the playwrights pull back. They go, oh, they start pulling back a little bit in their language and saying, well, how do we, how are we, when are we okay with violence and when are we not okay with it? And how do we explain that? And there's no simple, easy answer once that's out of the bag. Um, so uh, in some ways, this echoes what goes on in the world now. You know, it's not ancient history. We look at even what, what's going on in, in, in India now has its roots going way back to these late, late 19th, early 20th century. Um, it's just that, you know, if, if the British were corrupt, they've been replaced by corrupt Indian politicians <laughs> at this point. Um, but so much of India's policy is, in, and even its entertainment, Bollywood films, you can trace back to this fusion of Jatra into a stage play where you've got to have singing and dancing. You know, we think of uh, Bollywood film as having this mix of genres. It can be sad, mm -hmm. it can be funny, whatever it is, it also has that that's that's part of India's uh, culture, but it, it it goes right back. It's easy to trace it back to when these Bengali playwrights were trying to write back realist dramas, but the audience was demanding it needs to have a little bit of singing and dancing in it, or we're not going to be happy. Um, and so you know, it's it's very Bollywood when you look at it in retrospect. Yeah. So is that where you and Vijay met, Vijay? Padaki, um, who runs Bangalore Little Theater, who was on the show in December. Well, yeah, but it's yeah, it's kind of funny though. Actually, not quite. No, we met a few years before that. Um, he emailed me. This was probably like I forget. I have to if he's watching or he can chime in with this. It was like maybe 2014. I'm gonna say. He, the Bank Little Theater, had where they were doing plays about science, kind of like, excuse me, the Sloan Foundation had done in New York with Ensemble Studio Theater. You know, they were approaching hospitals, you know, and science-based organizations that might give them grants if they produced a play about a scientist or uh, something to that effect. Real people, biogra biographical plays. They knew about my play, Tesla's Letters, 
that sounds like a play about the letters of Nikola Tesla. It sounds like it's going to be documentary theater, but uh, Tesla's letters is, uh, you know, it's about Tesla, but it's set in the late 90s Balkans. It's about it's an anti-war play about experiences I had there, kind of semi-autobiographical. But anyway, not what they wanted. But that he reached out and said, we're thinking about doing your play. Can we read it? Mm. And I gave it to him and he's like, uh, yeah, not quite what we're after. And I said, yeah, that's fine with me. But we got to be friends because of that. So during one of my trips to India, not uh, not as a Fulbrighter, I, at my own expense, I was in Kolkata, but I flew down to Bangalore to meet him and meet the meet BLT. And they were doing a play then, which I really loved for this environmental. They had gotten permission to stage it in a fort in Bangalore, even though it's a national historic site. Um, it was about a great warrior named Tipu Sultan. And uh, this all was educational for me, more about India's history, but I was really amazed by BLT because, sure, there's amateur theater here uh, anywhere, but they were doing this very different thing, which was, uh, you know, BLT members, yes, it's volunteers, but you also learn stagecraft. You know, a little bit of carpentry. You learn a little bit of directing. Um, as part of that organization. And I thought that was a really cool way in. You weren't just joining it to act in a play. You were joining it to help be involved in, in making the play happen in, in other ways. So uh, he was really empowering people there to continue making plays after he's gone or, you know, after BLT, if it ever ceased to exist, they would still be equipped to keep doing plays. So I was blown away. So we just stayed in touch. And we've been trying for a few years now since then to find a way to collaborate or for a U.S. institution to collaborate with them and try to make something happen. And then uh, COVID, of course, didn't help. But because I knew him and had that connection, I, I factored him into my Fulbright uh, as part of like mainly I'm in Kolkata, but there was this detour down to Bangalore to continue doing some things with BLT. Uh, and uh, and we're still we're still looking for ways to work together. Uh, so I was so glad when you had him on as a as a guest because he's a truly yeah. incredible an incredible person for the world you know in terms of theater. A really Just, great guy. Yeah, the many different hats he's worn over the many decades of that theater is incredible and what it's done for the community. Um, speaking of detours, I'm I'm very fascinated in your um the um oh gosh where is it here um the article that you wrote <laughs> supernatural skeptics don't know what they're missing and i i yeah re which then reminded me that i had seen a show that you had done where you used well i'll have you describe it that the evp the electronic voice phenomena we were studying or you were looking at yeah tell me about Mm -hmm. when you decided well let's go back to the article on on supernatural skeptics don't know what they're missing and <laughs> and talk to me a yeah. little bit about that because that got into the story about the Ouija board and Jimi Hendrix from high school which I wanted to talk about too but yeah <laughs> let's let's yeah. start with let's um, start yeah what are we missing what are super sure. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I, uh, you know, partly probably because I, was, I grew up in Appalachia. I grew up reading the Jack Tales. I grew up in the Bible Belt where, you know, Satan was just around the corner lurking to jump out at us. And so I kind of had that, you know, belief in things inherent in me that there were supernatural things out in the woods at night and all that ghosts, things are haunted. And one thing I love, by the way, Bengali culture is very much similar to that. There's mm -hmm. not about do ghosts exist. It's of course they exist. Of course they're in the house, you know. And uh, <laughs> so I kind of relate it in that way as well, uh, as well there with people. So, um, you know, but I, at the same time, do I really believe it? I, it depends on which day of the week you ask me. But if someone says that house is haunted, don't go in. I'm going to be the first one in. Whether there's a ghost or not, I want to see or experience what they are experiencing that they are calling a ghost. And so what what always made me angry is, you know, these uh, angry, angry atheists online, these people who will go into like, you know, there's a tourist attraction out west called the mystery spot. You go in and strange things happen. 
happen and science doesn't work around the mystery spot, but it's clearly for entertainment. You read these angry atheists going in line debunking this. I'm like, you're debunking a tourist attraction. You're ruining it for a whole family who probably thinks it's the coolest thing and the kids think it's cool and you're going to come in there and de- 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 debunk it. Instruct the. It. Uh, I just thought, <laughs> what, what jerks you are. And so that article was. That article was kind of like responding to that in a certain way, like you don't know what you're missing. It doesn't it it's it doesn't matter whether it's real or not. It's that it's there to be experienced. And so that's very much how I've always felt about my Ouija board experiments and like the EVP stuff I did. It wasn't it didn't. There's a point where you go, I don't know where what's real or not, but something is happening and it's pretty intense. And, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know. I didn't do it obsessively. It came and went out of my life. But um, in uh, like early 2000s, while I was still in New York, I did this solo show. Um, it was called The Golden Horseshoe, A Lecture on Tragedy. And it was the story. I called it an autobiographical dark comedy. It was about my search and trying to connect with my biological father who I didn't know existed till I was in my twenties and like years of documents and legal battles and all this stuff. But, um, and I I was comfortable lecturing. So I pretended I was giving a lecture on Greek tragedy while I told this story of of my family. And because there was a sort of conceit in the show that men can't, we're bad with our emotions um, whenever there was an emotional monologue to be delivered, an actor on stage posing as my teaching assistant would get up and do the monologue for me as me while I sat and watched. And then I would comment about whether he had captured my emotions well. So it kind of became this very meta thing. We did that a few times in New York. But uh, the the thing I didn't ever get into in the show that I didn't think was relevant at that time was how I tried after in the middle of this battle to sort of connect with my biological father, he died. He drank himself to death. He died of acute alcoholism and related illnesses. So there was this period where I tried to use a Ouija board to contact him. Like, how do you get closure from a dead man? So that kind of became, and the the answer is you don't, but um, that became the second show I did in Philly, which was called beautiful Zion, a book of the dead. And, um, I don't think anyone here knew that it was, in my mind, a sequel to the first show. I mean, that didn't matter. It stood alone. It was its own thing. But it was a second solo show um, that had some elements of that first one, but had more of this uh, explained my forays into the supernatural and how I never succeeded at contacting my dead father. And the show ended with I took a few volunteers from the audience. This was in the basement of the uh, uh, the CEC, CEC, by the way. That's yeah. where I did mm-hmm. it. And ran yeah. The blue, the blue lounge or whatever that place in the yeah. basement was called. That's where I did it. So I had this room off to the side with a Ouija board, and I'd get two or three audience volunteers, and I would say, you guys try to contact my dead father. And they'd say, well, why can't you? And I'd say, because I might be subconsciously, like if it says, Jeff, I am your dad while I'm touching it, like I won't believe it because it's probably me doing it subconsciously. So you have to try. And we never we never contacted anyone claiming to be my dead father. And I had certain questions ready to ask. If it said, Jeff, I am your father, only things I would know the answer to and see if they knew it. Um, but the, the, so that never happened. But what did happen is crazy stuff. Every time we did the Ouija board, something wild would happen. It wasn't always scary. Sometimes it was funny. Sometimes it was really moving. Someone would walk out going, well, I, an audience member would say that was the most amazing thing of my life. And so I wound up going home every night and doing a little blog entry about here's what happened in the Ouija session at the end of the show. And it kind of partly became a marketing tool. I think people, some people were coming just to see, I want the Ouija part. What's going to happen? And um, I mean, there was no rigging it up. There was, it either happened or it didn't. I, you know, there was no trickery or anything involved and uh it was called uh i called it boneyards then i found out there was a video game called boneyards so i had to make sure to call it jeffrey stanley's boneyards <laughs> so, so no one thought it had anything to do with the video game but that i knew i wanted to be in a house of worship and i knew i wanted it didn't, i didn't care what the religion was and it needed to be in the cellar it was all about the foundations of religion uh, symbolically, so I needed it to be near the foundation of the building. 
And, um, and uh, so there was this storefront synagogue built in about 1911, not far from where I lived in South Philly. And it only they had a few congregants left. You know, they were Orthodox Jews. Or most of the people had died and moved away. And so I approached them. It was just a cold email like, hey, I'm wondering if you'd let me do a show there for the Philly Fringe. And they, they said, wow, this is amazing. We're trying to have this place designated as a local historic landmark so it's not demolished. And we were just thinking we should get someone to do a show here like the fringe. And so uh, it was like kismet that I went in there at that time. And they were showing me all the parts of the synagogue and where I could do the show here and there and upstairs. And there's this other room. And I said, Ken, is there a cellar? And they said, yeah, but you don't want to go down there. It's weird and dark and creepy. And I said, yeah, I'd really like to see that. And that's when I went, what is this show about exactly? <laughs> I, I told them and I said, I'll show you the script. And if you think it's inappropriate, I will not do it. That's fine. But you need to know that I try to contact the dead during the show, which is strictly forbidden in Judaism and lots of other religions. But I said, it doesn't matter whether you believe in it or not. I believe in it some days and some days I don't, but we will be making an earnest, non-farcical serious attempt to contact the dead in the cellar. And uh, they thought about it and got back to me and said, just keep it out of the synagogue proper, like upstairs, right. no contacting the dead in the in holy the, space. I right. said, done. So, uh, yeah. And so the show happened there. Is that, is that the one you saw? That's you know the one I saw. Yeah. Of those mm -hmm. shows. As I remember. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm trying to think about location. So it was the same yeah, we did the Ouija thing, but then I, I sort of beefed it up and, and got, I learned in the meantime about the, the PSB 87 spirit box, you know, people trying to use electronics to communicate with the dead. That really interested me. And I thought, will it work in front of an audience and what will happen? And uh, so it, uh, every night we kind of had the same model. We, I did the show, a Ouija thing happened in the back. But then I took out the PSB87. I just plugged it into a loudspeaker so people could hear it while we did the Ouija thing. It was like it was happening simultaneous. And a lot of it you couldn't tell in that moment. I would go home and listen back to it later and realize it was saying things in synchronicity with what was going on at the Ouija board. Now, a couple of times it was very audible. You know, it would call out someone's name. One time a guy in the audience, I mean, he was, his name was Michael. He said, I'll do it and sat. And the Ouija board at some point had said, you know, it was like, I am so-and-so. I died in Philadelphia in 1872. And, and it said, why are you here tonight in this old storefront synagogue? And it spelled out on the Ouija board, I came to see Michael. Well, this freaked out the guy named Michael who was in the audience and then about that same time on the spirit box, very clearly, this voice screamed out, Michael. <laughs> and so everybody freaked out. Um, I know it sounds funny. It's not always funny. Sometimes it's scary, but there was no, uh, you never knew what would happen. Sometimes nothing happened. It wasn't always dramatic, but something was happening. We all mm -hmm. felt the energy from that. And um, so I wish I could tell you I'm an expert on the paranormal. I'm not. I have read uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. A lot of these have been renamed, to, like, for example, the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, because it sounds less creepy that way. I've read all those things. I'm fascinated by them, and I can talk about them and what's in them, uh, but I don't uh, know what the real answer is. I'm not, and I'm not a fortune teller or anything like that. I mean, a couple of people online who never saw the show jumped on me and thought I was a fake spirit medium like the Fox sisters, tricking people, taking their money. And I, you know, they didn't, and no one would believe me. I said, unless you I come and see the show, I will let, let you see it for free. You can come in before, during, after, inspect everything. They're just people who were, knew I was tricking. I just said, I'm not. I'm a professional storyteller. Uh, there's no trickery that's going to help me do the show better. Like, come see it and you'll see what I mean. Um, but most people know, knew I was sincere, uh, but I, you know, I'm still as mystified by it as uh, now as I was then. But that very much is what inspired that article. Supernatural skeptics don't know what they're missing. 
Um, some people look at that Jimi Hendrix Elvis story and go, well, this is juvenile male fantasy. None of this happened. I was like, well, it did happen. And there were women there too. And maybe we were all a bunch of horny teenagers, but you know, it was what it was. It happened as I described it. Maybe we're a bunch of horny teenagers in the Bible belt, but, and that was what was on our minds subconsciously, but there it is. So, so going uh, back to yeah, the Jimi Hendrix, the Jimi Hendrix Ouija <laughs> Yeah. thing which we'll put the link yeah. in there from do you look back on that yeah. on that experience and still because the way you described it in the article is that people were pretty freaked out the young woman i mean the cat yes. got, you know jumped, the christmas tree started on fire i mean and it fire, seemed like a series cat, of events right um but do you look back on that and think do, do you believe that it happened oh yeah I mean, I'm nice. I still am in touch with those people, not regularly, but they still live there. And every so often it comes up and they mm -hmm. go, yeah, or especially when that article came out, you know, they knew about it. And we're like, yeah. And telling their friends, like, that's what happened. And there, it still scares the crap out of me to this day. I mean, I don't look back at it and go, well, maybe we exaggerated. Mm -hmm. Like it happened. That stuff happened. And the witnesses are there who can still attest to the fact that that happened. So, you know, when you're telling your, the last story about, about, the, about your show, you mentioned some days I believe it, some days I believe it, sometimes I don't. That's, those aren't the words you use, but that was the general gist of it. What do you think, what is it that changes your mind about that? Western rational thought. I've been corrupted Right. I mean, maybe we all have in a certain way. There's a part of me that knows or wants to know that knows this can't be true. There is no supernatural. There are no ghosts. There's another part of me that says believing in it is a matter of faith. It's like anything religious you're going to believe in. Some people are going to tell you it's not true and you're going to have to just cling to your faith. So mm -hmm. I think there's days when I may be more faithful than I am other days. Um you know, it's funny by by maybe as an analogy um, in the book that I'm working on, like there there are times when there are these Bengali revolutionaries, right? They like bombed a judge's carriage and killed a couple people and people reacted with shock and horror in various ways then like we do now. And it's like, of course, the British were calling them terrorists, anarchists. A lot of Bengalis were saying freedom fighter revolutionary. And it harkened me back to, let's say, John Brown. John Brown, terrorist or good guy? Depends on, and I say it depends on which day of the week you ask me. You, you ask me, you know, Emerson said of, of John Brown, he has made the gallows as glorious as the grave. Stephen Vincent Benet said he knew how to die. But this is a guy who tried to start an uprising, an armed revolution. Seven people got killed, and that was kind of went south after that, no pun intended. It didn't ever get off the ground, but we look back at him today. If you go to Harper's Ferry, and you just kind of scratch your head and go, sometimes I think he's a good guy. Other days, I think he was batshit crazy and got some people killed for no good reason. So it's sort of like... By analogy, that, you know, uh, I, some days I believe uh, for sure it's this way or that way. And other days I'm not so sure. I question myself. And, uh, you know, so if one day I believe in ghosts and, yeah, that's real. Other days I look back at the Jimi Hendrix thing and go, I know that all happened exactly like that. But I want to rationalize it and say it was all coincidences. Mm hmm. Can Cat you knocked over the candle? Yeah. Can there you give us the two minute version it. of the Jimi Hendrix story? Not the two minute. You can go. Oh. You, you've got time here. We've got some time, but it's it's worth telling. I think. I mean, we've given the bits and well, pieces, but um, we. Have... <laughs> well, it was you know it was late at night, and and you know the the articles there. I know you put the links to the article. I would trust the article more than my recollection of it here and now. But you know there were a few of us sitting around, bored at the end of the night. And it was sort of a Christmas party. And so, I don't know exactly how it started, probably with me. But like, why don't we have a seance? Well, we don't have a Ouija board. Now you can make one. So, you know, we drew letters on a sheet of paper. We needed something to use for a planchette. I, I love this. The credit card turned upside down because the raised letters on the credit card gave it this very low surface area. So it was really smooth. 
we kind of used one corner as the pointer and we each put one finger and started moving around. And uh, so my friend had been playing the guitar earlier, my friend Adam, and his acoustic guitar was open in its case on the floor. And he was very all into, I want to talk to Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix, are you there? And it starts saying yes. And he's asking Jimi Hendrix all these questions that only Jimi Hendrix would know, according to my friend. And he had read Jimi's biography and knew when and where he was born and his dad's name and all this stuff. But, you know, this is before you could just find this on the Internet in two seconds. He really knew Jimi's life story. None of us did. So he was freaking out because it was answering the questions. And then he said, Jimmy, can you uh, play my guitar? And it kept saying yes. And it, and I didn't, I did not believe this was ever going to happen, but it kept shooting to yes, circling yes, the corner of the credit card, you know, and every so often it would fly off and we'd put it back on and it would shoot to yes again. It was like this energy. We're all kind of freaking out. And then all of a sudden this kitten comes running in from the other room, my friend's kitten. I mean, we knew the kitten was in the house, but the kitten comes running in from the other room and starts smacking at my friend's guitar and random playful kitten or possessed by the spirit of Jimi Hendrix, right? That's where you have to decide, (laughs) but it happened like that, right? So I'm not guaranteeing you Jimi Hendrix possessed the kitten. I'm telling you, these things happen. You have to decide from there. And it goes on. Yeah. Uh, there, you know, things go on from there. <laughs> and I urge you, I thank you for putting the link there. Oh, you know, that it's... article, some people, some people, that article gets them angry. And, you know, so it, it depends on who you are. D- what gets them angry about it? Just that it, they these things don't happen? It oh, yeah. Okay. The, I, there's no way it happened. And it's, if it did happen, this is like Freudian teenage angst being manifested. Mm-hmm. It's clearly not supernatural. And maybe it, I, I can't say that's not right. Okay. But it, it did mm-hmm. happen. I am not lying. This, these, these events happened on that night in this way. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, yeah, like that. So how do you feel the, these kinds of events and even the working on the show did, did, did working on the show, produce results for you that were unexpected in in just in terms of because I think you said you didn't we you know you weren't you didn't feel you were successful in contacting your father but did 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 it take you to places in terms of that aspect that were unexpected yes yeah I mean you know it's first of all some really profound things happened uh, and I mean, I don't mind. I can tell you one of those things. I'll tell you a short version that, you know, one night I'm very convinced that this uh, a guy in the audience who became a friend of mine later. We didn't know each other before that. We're doing the Ouija and the sound spirit box was on and it was really insane. But basically it was like a little girl's ghost. And she had uh, been been in that building before because the building before had been consecrated as a synagogue, had been a store around that neighborhood. So she knew it from then. I mean, that's what was coming off in the personality. And basically what it came down is, you know, I started realizing, especially after I read the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, you know, I started looking at the ghosts differently, not as like interesting personalities for us to interact with but like they shouldn't be here these are people who should be going on right and uh you know the way that if you look at the tibetan book of the dead tibetan book of living and dying you know there's this place called the bardo it's like the place in between before you go on to your next incarnation and there are very specific instructions in there um you're kind of in a sort of a wasteland and it's like there's this one super uh let's say hot glowing area uh and but it's kind of hard to see because it's really smoky and stuff and then there's this one super hot white light over here and uh you know people always go the wrong way you know the sort of the cliche of run toward the light they tend to want to go the wrong direction and also the problem is going the right direction going toward the light there are these monsters between you and the light there's these this gauntlet of monsters Now, these are manifestations of your own fears and your earthbound Mm -hmm. things that are keeping you earthbound. But the monsters can't hurt you. But you don't know that. You have to run through them. 
fearlessly or swallow your fear and go. Can't be afraid, run through the monsters. So I had read that. Now, I'm not touching the board, but this little girl is saying, well, they're, what are you, we're, saying, we're saying to her, what are you seeing? She's describing the bardo, and the guy doing it, uh, he didn't know anything about it. He hadn't read that book before. I mean, we became friends later, and I was like, dude, she's describing what Tibetans say. And so we really convinced her to run toward the light. But, you know, she's like a little Irish Christian girl. I was like, she doesn't want some Tibetan chant. And then the we started saying, you, Joe, well, that other guy was Joe. It turned out he had read, his father had been this uh, fundamentalist Christian minister, and he rebelled against that, kind of like I did, got all away from that as a grown up. But it kept saying, you, Joe. And it said, remember again. And it was sort of like, Joe, this kid is not us. This kid needs like the Lord's prayer, right? To be inspired mm -hmm. to run through the monsters. So we did this thing. And then, you know, the Ouija board planchette just suddenly circles uh, around and then stops. And I was like, I think she's gone. She ran through the monsters. You know, she needed to hear Jesus wants you to do this not the Buddha mm -hmm. wants you to do this or anything else. So, you know, we had this weird, interesting crossover moment and we really felt like we think, I think we got a kid to heaven, you know, <laughs> or where, or to the place where she needs to think of, think things over and reincarnate again later, you know, depending on your views, but that moved the crap out of us. I mean, spine chilling stuff happened that had nothing mm -hmm. to do with my father or any of that. And going to the synagogue, I would go there a lot, pre-show and record stuff anyone going to talk on the spirit box today just me alone in the building and i started realizing i was hearing the same voices repeatedly each time and i narrowed it down and uh one time during a show i said by the way some of these voices i've heard before i said uh i said i call them the synagogue saints and i said i don't know how many of them there are i've counted 10 or 11 and then the spirit box said 12 of us right on, you know, right at, on cue at that moment. And so I felt like I had these friends who were coming every night to see the show, <laughs> the ghost, ghost friends. Uh, and, uh, you know, at the same time, I thought, you know, you shouldn't be here. Get get on. Get out of here. Uh, you shouldn't be lingering in this in-between place. And you would ask, I would ask them, why are you staying? And a lot of times, just like people were afraid, afraid to go. This is more familiar to me. Um, so you can't always make them go just because you explain the bardo to them. Some of them are still going to go, yeah, I'm too bad I'm staying here. <laughs> so where it's familiar. So, you know, those moments, I'm a true believer. Then a few days, weeks go by, and I look back and go, that was just all of my hearing nonsense and deciding it was voices, you know, uh, that's what I mean. Depends on which day you ask me. I, I kind of go back and forth. I think I read in one of your articles that, that the exploration into this is, is an attempt to, to, or a way of, of con connecting or deciding on, on a, a spiritual place. Does that make, uh, is that, was that, yeah, uh, yeah, define it? I mean, I feel like, yeah, I don't know if I fully defined it, but you know, I clearly I'm a spiritual person. I like, I think part of getting older is admitting this about myself. Um, it's true, like Stanley, you have this spiritual need, it doesn't matter what other people think. Um, what is that? What is that spiritual need? I don't, you know, I'm kind of one of those, you know, like many people, uh, don't like dogma, don't like being told it's this way or that way exclusively, or our religion is the right one. And for me, uh, even before uh, I became personally involved uh, with, with, with an Indian person, an Indian family, back when I was a teenager, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, I stumbled upon that at a flea market, and it really spoke to me. And it was always staying in the back of my mind. I mean, for one reason or another, I'm very I've always been very drawn toward Eastern religion. Uh, but even within that, there are so many stripes of that uh but one thing i like about it is it tends to not be heavy on dogma it allows a lot of spiritual growth all all still under the umbrella of say hinduism or buddhism so um that's kind of where i feel like i belong i i like it there 
it still allows uh, you to have an identity uh, within a religion, but also to be free to explore. Do you think you'll do a um, more performance work in the same vein as um, your former show? Probably. I mean, one thing about solo shows is they're cheap. <laughs> they're easy, pretty easy to do. Um, what really, I mean, I know COVID, in fact, uh, it impacted all of us. But even aside from that, I've spent the past two years uh, really doing nothing but writing this book. I'm very excited about what I discovered in India, uh, his, the history, and also the, the, excuse me, the personal journey I went on there that, you know, the book is historical, scholarly, if you will, but it's told in the first person. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's really a memoir. Right now I'm calling it The Light and Shadow Game, a memoir of film, theater, and independence in India. So that is where my writing energy has been going uh, and is still going at this point uh, to find, get that done and then hopefully find a home for it and get it out into the world. I feel like until that happens, I'm not going to be able to really to, uh, think ahead to a, to a show that, but I have some ideas in the back of my mind that I like, yeah, sooner or later, I feel like I'm going to do another show. Uh, will it be supernatural or not? I'll, I'll follow my bliss when that happens. Or a screenplay. I mean, I should say I'm still, I mean, I haven't done any new screenwriting, but right before I went to India, I was actually working on a TV pilot set here in Philadelphia. It's historical with a friend of mine and we are shopping that around right now. I mean, that would be a wonderful, magical thing if that happened and, and uh, that could be shot here in Philly and, and I could not go anywhere and keep working on my book, you know, while that happened, but you know, uh, we'll see uh, about that as well. And also, I want to say, I, I think I forgot to say this earlier. I'm looking at the clock. I think maybe we're almost mm -hmm. out of time. Uh, if you are an artist or a writer or a teacher right now listening to this and you are thinking, oh, I could never get a Fulbright. Uh, I'm going to plug Fulbright here for a minute and just tell you, you should look into it. Um, you don't have to teach at a university. They, they give them to individual artists, individual scholars. Now, why would you need to travel abroad? That's the thing you need to answer. Not on a whim, but, you know, if you are working in theater in a certain tradition or you have a relationship with a theater outside the U.S. and you're thinking of collaborating with them or there's something related to that that you really want to go research to either bring back to your theater company here or write about in some way, you have a shot at getting a Fulbright scholarship. Uh, so you should uh, consider it, look into it. Uh, don't think that it's only for academics. And, you know, I teach part time at a couple of places, but I don't have a PhD. I'm an instructor. Um, I like it that way. I like being able to come and go and be a little bit independent. So, um, you know, you should look into the Fulbright. And if you have any questions, I'm going to do my job as, as a Fulbright ambassador. Drop me a line. I'll do my best to answer those questions for you. What is the the most surprising piece of gold you've uncovered in your journey working on this project about yourself? Or? Exciting. Most, uh, probably definitely yeah. about myself. Um, I think that a lot of it is about, I, I don't want to scoop myself and, and say specifically, but I will say that that sort of working subtitle I have, um, the light and shadow game, that's referring to something specific that I explain in the book, but uh, a memoir of film, theater, and independence in India. Independence is a certain double meaning. It's about the independence movement and about film and theater as it relates to that. But it's also very much about, I think, me finding my own independence there, uh, having my own, my own interface with India, my own points of view about it. Uh, and uh, my own network of friends and family there. And so India will always remain a part of my life, no matter what I do. And, um, uh, you know, I'm, ra I'm raising a, a bilingual, biracial uh, Hindu child in Philadelphia, and I'm very excited about that, too, and very proud of that as well. I think what I've learned is that I'm, I'm in the, that way, emotionally and spiritually, I'm in the right place. I think that got confirmed for me during, during my journey there. 
it wasn't a play, you know, a lot of books about India. I think there's a cliche that someone goes there, a Westerner goes there and has a profound spiritual mm-hmm. experience on a spiritual awakening. I don't want to fall into that trap with that sort of book. Um, uh, like uh, whatever spiritual thing I had happened a long time ago. Uh, I just think it maybe was reaffirmed for me being there. But um, the discoveries I made about myself there were not really spiritual discoveries. I felt like I was pretty grounded in that already. Um, mm-hmm. They were other kinds of discoveries that I, that I made that I, that I share with the reader in the book. When do you, um, when do you hope that you'll share it with us? Uh, to tomorrow, later tonight. That's what I hope. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, <laughs> you got to you got to get off because you got to get the last chapter in, right? <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, not a know, very I fair question, to, but it's it it takes well. The time I want, it takes. here's what I want. I mean, I think it. I think the book is super important. I think the book needs a publisher that will publish it in the U.S., India, and the U.K. simultaneously, at least those three countries. It is going to ruffle feathers in all three of those countries. Um, some people aren't going to be happy with what I discovered and what I have to say and in all kinds of areas, big ones and small ones. Um, but I think it's stuff that needs to say. I think I have found I have something to contribute to this historical conversation. I found things no one has found and no one has written about that I'm super excited about. So as soon as possible. (laughs) Tonight. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jeffrey Stanley, so much for your journeyman um, in all ways, shapes and forms. And I look forward to, uh, yeah, I want to see another, another, one person show and a screenplay of that show and to read about your journeys in India. Thank you for having me. And uh, it was really exciting for me that you asked me to come here and talk about this. And uh, it's, it's really fun for me. So I I appreciate it. It's my, it's my pleasure. And I had so many, so many questions we didn't get to, but that's, that's another time and place. Once that book is done, we'll do that. Good luck to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Take All right. Care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody, for being with us. And next week's guest is Theodore Harris. Theodore is a, an artist. He is um, a poet. He's an essayist on the intersection of art and politics. Uh, he's a collagist. And you're going to see so much of his wonderful work that has been in museums internationally here in Philadelphia, around the country and around the world. And we're going to talk to him about his work next week. That's Theodore Harris, Saturday, March the 27th at 5 p.m. Best of luck to you this week with your health. Uh, Be well, take care, and we hope to see you at the table again. 